thank you for uh, both of you. It's an honor to speak to both of you. There you are. Um, about this wonderful film. Uh, thank you for giving me your time. You're welcome. Now, I guess my first question is, Mr. Cumming, when you heard about this project, it's probably something you've never really seen or done before. What was it about this particular unique set of circumstances behind this project that had you go all in and participate in the manner that you did? Well, I, I had actually had this um, weird connection to this story from, from a quarter of a century ago because I was going to, in 1997, I was um, going to, I was attached to and was in the process of going to make a, a direct a film and play the Brandon Lee character. Um, and so, and, and then, you know, in about a couple of years after that, the film fell apart. So I, I had always had this, I knew about this character because when it happened, when all, you know, when the story broke in the early 1990s, it was a huge story in Scotland. And, um, and then I was going to play him. So it was an amazing thing that after a quarter of a century, uh, this character came back to me. So, uh, and also I knew Jono, we were friends before uh, this film. So I, I, it was someone I knew and I trusted and also a character that I knew and was sort of had kind of unfinished business with. Jono, what was it about uh, Alan that you knew he was the one to take this story uh, to new heights, we'll say? Because I knew that he had this connection to it. I knew that, um, and I just, cannot imagine I can't think of another Scottish actor who could personify Brandon in this way who you know has the really unique qualities that Alan brings to each role um I knew that it was, it was such a big ask I knew it was a really big ask of someone let alone a friend to come along and lip sync this entire film I knew it needed a really special actor because it, the entire film hangs off it if Alan had messed this up we'd have been in trouble <laughs> <laughs> and and so that day that we filmed it was kind of terrifying for me. But at the same time, I knew that it was Alan Cumming doing it. So he was going to pull it off. And, and boy, did he. Now, Mr. Cumming, when you're given a project, you obviously you get a script, you get a set of circumstances, et cetera. You get all things that you're normally used to. But that's got to be one way to prepare, I imagine. But how do you prepare to essentially, as you just said, lip sync this role? I mean, is it a same, same set of preparation or is it a different preparation that you go through? Uh, it is different. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I didn't have a script. It wasn't a script, but I had the interview and I had the bits that I was going to have to lip sync. And I also had seen a cut of the film as it was at that point, you know, that John showed me. So I understood so I had actually, perhaps in a funny way, more uh, of a sort of insight into the end product than I normally would when you just sort of get a script and start filming. But so I had, but it was such a weird thing that, like, you know, you you make up a character and you become this person. But this was me doing that with a really large part of that already dictated because I was I was not using my voice. So I, it was fascinating. And also you had, had to be technically very accurate because I needed to not, you know, I've, nothing drives me nuts more than a bad lip syncing drag queen. So I just thought <laughs> I have a duty to uh, get it right, just so that I can throw shade on drag queens in the future. But um, so technically it was a very difficult thing because, you know, I'm not really one of those, you know, some people are really good at lip syncing. There's that whole thing on social media and TikTok, especially all of those people that do these great and that other thing, whatever you call it, you know, the people lip sync lines from films and all these things. I'm sure. not that my thing at all. I've never done this. It's never been something I wanted to do. I could never even remember the lyrics of songs anyway. So uh, it was a big leap. And I just sort of listened to the tapes and just kind of the thing I normally do is I just sort of let something, let a character come into me and let it be infused into my mind and my body and uh but it was harder this time because i know well it was harder because it was an element that i didn't control but of course it was easier because there was a big part of it already there were there mannerisms you found yourself doing as you were listening that you incorporated in your performance or did you do some research about how this person would have 
acted or, or moved in a certain way during this process that you threw into the role? Well, I could hear on the tape, like his, when he smiled, I could hear the sort of clickiness of his mouth moving. And you know, when, sometimes when you do self, when people ask you for a selfie, you can, especially in America, because everyone just smiles, uh, you know, everyone immediately smiles when a camera comes out, no matter if they're feeling depressed. And so you can sometimes when you're doing a selfie with people, you can hear the sound of their lips going into a smile, that sort of dry click that is them smiling. So I could hear on this tape lots of little sounds that his mouth is making as he smiled or uh, swallowed or something like that. So that really helped. It was, it, that, that was the kind of biggest clue. And also he's quite sort of drawly. So he's, he's, and also he's very much sort of, um, you know, the, a, a drawl is also sometimes a mask for someone taking their time to, to make sure that they are not um, wrong-footed or giving too much away. So Jonah, when you're doing this really pivotal part here, filming Alan essentially lip-syncing the uh, testimony, um, was there a moment where he did something and you were like, hot damn, I knew he was the right one for this role. I just think like, it was just, it was the moment he walked into set, really, and <laughs> everyone out, because he's in the costume. He's in, and what I should say is that the person who Alan is portraying in the film is the personification of the false Brandon that I knew, of what he would look like now if he had grown up. Because you know that was there was a certain element of disguise that was pr present in his time that was spent with us. So once we got Alan into costume and character and hair, um, uh, he he kind of walked on set and 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 just from those very first moments when you know that was kind of a, to breathe a sigh of relief to see him inhabit that character. The very first thing we filmed is my is the introduction when I first you know, kind of asked Brandon to give me his name and. And, and we have that first kind of interaction because that's the other weird thing is Alan's not it was not just only lip syncing necessarily to what Brandon was saying, but he's responding to questions that I was asking in the real Brandon um, back when we when I recorded that interview with him. So it was it was weird because I was there in the room when the real thing happened, and now here I've recreated this new version, and there's someone else playing that role. But um, no, it was I mean our editor actually came along to watch. And he went up to Alan and on a break and was like, oh my God, I think you just turned into Brandon. I don't think Alan, I think Alan was a bit kind of freaked out by, <laughs> by that comparison. But well, I know he absolutely did and personified him. Yeah, for sure. I, I also feel, it when he's, because I feel it's such an unattractive look for me. So that, it's kind of, you know, when people say, oh, you're so good, it was the perfect role for you, or you were born to play this part, and think, oh, uh, I don't feel particularly attractive in this role. Or when you're born to play this part and you're playing a serial killer or something. You know, it's kind of, <laughs> it's not always a compliment. I, re I read a review yesterday that said, what a fantastic film. The only downside was the terrible toupee that Alan was wearing. I'm like, dude, that's his <laughs> hair. <laughs> do, you do either of you think that a... Do any of you think that Brandon would consider himself a villain in this story or a, a, an evil person? We'll start with Al, then I'll go to Jono. Not at all. No, and I don't think he is either. I, I, not at all. I, uh, but I don't think, I think he would, I think, I think he sees himself as the, as the victim. And I think most people see him as a, an audacious shapeshifter. Jono? Yeah, no, absolutely no. He only, he did, he, when you meet Brandon and when you spend time with him and when he explains what he did and why he did it to you, you sort of start to fall under the spell and you, it starts to make a weird kind of logical sense. That's how kind of charismatic and engaging he is, that he can convince you that this crazy thing that he did was absolutely for the right reasons and he absolutely had to do it. But like, I guess my question is, what happens in a person's life that, compels you to take this path that Brandon does. And I think you do a brilliant job of kind of diving into that and leaving the audience to kind of make their own judgments. Um, I mean, do you find yourself asking that question, Jenna? 
Yeah, I mean, I think actually one of the characters and one of the main characters in the film is the town of Bears Den, where the school is. Um, it's a town that's almost right. the kind of Beverly Hills of Glasgow, and it's a town of privilege, and it's a town where the kids very much have an expectation of success. And perhaps people uh, want to live in that town because they have an expectation of success for their children. But what happens when those pressures and expectations of success become too, too much and perhaps lead someone to make some unusual decisions? I guess that's what the film looks at. Yeah, anything to add, Alan? Um, I, yeah, I think the idea of parental pressure and the idea that you want to please, you, you want, you realize, a lot of people I think realize they've gone into careers that they didn't really seek out. They, really, they were merely following the path that their parents had set out for them. I definitely feel there's a lot of that in Brandon's story and they're wanting to, wanting to um, chart a path that perhaps his mum and dad wanted him to have rather than the one that he wanted. As a performer, I have to imagine, even in this situation, there has to be a part of this film that you cause you the most stress, okay? Maybe it was a part of the testimony that you knew you had to kind of nail that moment or perhaps the, everything we had done before would be lost. Um, Mr. Mr. Cumming, what, is there a moment that you can recall from this uh, filming? I mean, just I just did two days of this of film. There was, and one day was completely just only sitting at a desk, lip right. sync. Right. I mean, the whole thing was, <laughs> the whole thing was that. The whole thing was, right. I, it'd fuck up Jonas entire film if you know or you wouldn't you know what would what would happen if we, if if I didn't get this right if I didn't make it and, and I had to sort of do something that it would only be successful if it didn't draw attention to itself so it was you know one of those things that and that's actually I realized the thing about lip syncing is lip syncing when you if you overdo it it draws more attention to the fact that you're lip syncing I mean I've lip synced many times in films and stuff like that when you, you know there's music and or I've done ADR where you've got to but you're lip syncing yourself that's a different thing but yeah I mean the whole thing was one of these things that I you just can't think about it because it's too it would be too um, scary otherwise and, and luckily there was a lot going on in the world at the time so I just kind of got on with it. Was there such a personal connection Jonah to the story that it gave you kind of angst knowing that you had to tell the story in the right manner. Yeah, you need to talk to my psychotherapist about that. It's been, it's been, it's been really intense, like, I, like really, really intense to make a film about something that you're as connected to as this, um, that takes you back. It, takes, it took everybody back in time, you know, it took Alan back in time to a role that he was meant to play all, all those years ago. And it took me back to my 16 year old self who is someone that I had broken off from and ran away from and didn't look back. You know, I was a 16 year old gay kid at school who had my own secrets to keep. And when I left school, I didn't ever want to look back. Um, and actually the most embarrassing thing for me was that the Brandon Lee scandal broke on my very first week at journalism school. So I was the kind of dunce of the class that everyone was looking at going, sorry, you didn't realize that in your classroom, this <laughs> big story was happening. Um, so yeah, it was it, it was it was really emotional at points. But the, the most amazing part for all of us really has been, you know, we've never had a high school reunion. We've never done it. And um, our premiere that we did in Glasgow earlier this year doubled as that. And so suddenly that reunion was 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 us all gathered together on a red carpet for the Scottish press. It was very surreal. You both kind of seem almost hypercritical of what you guys do no matter how good it turns out um that you watch We're, it and you're like oh, oh or i could have done this or i could have done that am, am i off base there uh this is to both of you we'll start with jono then alan oh uh, we're scottish that's what we do <laughs> <laughs> alan, anything to I, add? and also i think if uh, you know if you're an artist it's there's never a there's never a, a finishing line. There's never a, 
you know, there's, it's not like a puzzle that you've solved. It's always, there's always a possibility that you could have done it differently or better. And so I think it's the health, and I think it's actually healthy. I think, you know, to, to, I mean, to sit, to sit back, it's like when you feel nervous about going on stage or doing performing, I think people say, oh, shouldn't you have got used to it by now after all these years? But actually, I think if I didn't, if I wasn't nervous, I would be really scared because it would mean that I didn't care. And I think like how we're talking is about the fact that we care enough that we don't feel it. Uh, it's not that I don't, it's not that we think we did a bad job. I think we both think this film's really great. <laughs> but I think that we you always, it's a, it's a, you know, it's telling a story and relating a story and especially such a personal one for Jono and one that I've had a personal connection to, it's never going to be, we're never going to be able to say, oh, pat ourselves on the back and say, that was it. You know, I think it's, it's an ever evolving thing.